And we think so too. We were going to do a, we were going to do a bunch of exercises that we had made up as the uh, Lunar Olympics. Show you what a guy could do on the moon with a backpack on. But uh, for a 380 pound guy, that's pretty good. They they threw that out. Yeah, jump flat footed straight in the air. 300, about four feet. Wow. There were three goals in today's Gemini flight, a good launch in orbit, a successful walk in space, and satisfactory rendezvous in space with the capsule's booster. Two worked, one didn't. First, the launch itself. The launch had to be delayed for an hour and 16 minutes when electrical trouble developed in the erector. It was rather like running out to drive your new sports car only to find that the garage door was stuck. Well, finally, the malfunction was corrected, the erector was lowered, and the final countdown began. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. It was a picture book launch as the countdown hit zero close to 30,000 pounds of liquid fuel ignited. For a split second, the rocket shuddered hovered over the launch pad, then rose gracefully, majestically toward the sky. With a roar that could be heard for miles up and down the Florida beaches, the Gemini Titan IV was rising upward at the exact 72-degree angle. In the blockhouse, technicians and scientists used one word to describe it beautiful. And those were the same words that Jim McDivitt, the command pilot, radioed back to Cape Kennedy. Five minutes after launch and after the first stage of the Titan booster had separated, the 7,000-pound Gemini spacecraft hit that keyhole in the sky. The scene at the White House was no different, as you saw just a second ago, than it was at millions of homes around the country and in many other sections of the world. The president sat before his television set from shortly before launch until the Gemini 4 had successfully gone into orbit. Later, he said, we've had an exciting morning, but there was more to come. For a period of about 20 minutes today, Astronaut Edward White walked in space, out of his spacecraft, but attached to it by a nylon tether. As a point of curiosity, in earthly terms, White walked the distance from Hawaii to Bermuda. Not so impressive, perhaps, to spacemen. Probably the high point of the day was the conversation between ground and capsule as White walked in space. And here's the way a portion of it went. Let me take a close-up Speared up my windshield, you dirty dog. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know exactly where we are, but it looks like we're about over Texas again. Matter of fact, yeah, it looks like Houston's down below us. Yeah, that's Gil's thing right there. Hey. The flight director says get back in. Uh, Jim, uh, what? Got your message for us? Jimmy Ford, get back in. Okay. <laughs> we still got three and a half more days to go, buddy. Obviously, White was enjoying himself immensely. At a news conference in Houston this afternoon after the walk in space, that feat was a natural subject for questioning, as was the comparison between White's walk and that of the Russian cosmonaut Leonov. ABC correspondent Bob Young put the question. Do you consider uh, Ed White's performance a significant advance over the Russian performance in space? 
I consider what Ed White done, did a significant advancement in the space flight operational capability of the United States. <laughs> Also, in comparison to the Russians, I think you have to give the Russians a great deal of credit for for their extravehicular activity. Uh, we had uh, extravehicular activity ourselves uh, today, and also gained the experience of being able to to maneuver uh, with a with a thruster that permits the astronaut to to go where he wants to go in space without uh, reference to any other object, without holding on to anything, without pulling on anything. And this is uh, extremely important when, one, uh, when we want the astronauts to go out and gather film from, uh, say, the back of a future capsule or over to another, ob to another uh, spacecraft. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla, what, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Well, what didn't succeed in today's flight was a rendezvous with the capsule booster because simply the rendezvous was called off. Trying to keep up with the orbiting booster during the first revolution, the spacecraft began using fuel at an unexpectedly high rate. These comments from capsule and ground tell the story. Uh, Gwyneth, this is Gemini 4. We're going to have to get resolution right away whether you want me to to really make a major effort to close this last thing or to save the fuel? I think we should save the fuel. Climber, do you read Gemini 4? Uh, Roger, uh, we copy. We suggest uh, you stand by. We want to save the fuel. Okay. I guess we've probably extended about 100 feet per second. You've extended 100 feet per Negative. second? Negative. Don't think it's worth it. That's just a rough guess. Oh, Roger. I don't think it's worth it. The mission director has decided not to attempt any closer approaches to the booster. That is, he will not attempt, the Gemini 4 spacecraft will not attempt to come closer to the booster during the, during this revolution when we will attempt uh, extravehicular activity. And he will not attempt to come any closer during the fifth revolution as previously announced. This is what the Russians have in mind for us, a film preview of the future from Soviet science. We're looking at a portion of an extensive film animation prepared by the Soviets of a projected trip to the moon, one they claim will be a reality in the next five to ten years. At the beginning of such a flight, a spaceship propels a multi-stage rocket. As the speed increases, the rocket breaks away, and then various other stages the rocket also fall away. After a time, it is traveling by inertia alone, with no further energy required. Powerful radar stations keep the rocket within the grasp of its radio signals. And automatically operated instruments on the ground send radio impulses back to the rocket from the Earth. And they're received by ground stations. This station guides the rocket with the help of machines to count the electronic impulses. The rocket races forward along an orbit that has been calculated months in advance. But at a command from the Earth, it can launch into another orbit. When a rocket has traveled beyond the Earth's gravity, it can head toward its goal, the gravitational field of the moon. Now a refueling rocket sets out from the Earth, and now a rocket is headed into the moon. When it reaches the moon, a laboratory and tank treads will launch out to explore the moon. The Soviet scientists who designed this project describe it as fully possible. pattern of Soviet science and space. Where are we, we ask tonight. Our project Mercury will get off the ground in its first short man shot near the end of this month. A short ride, 115 miles to the edge of space. April 28th is the earliest date. As for an orbital flight, like Russia did today, that won't come until near the end of the year, maybe not even until early next year. Ten days ago at Mercury headquarters, Langley Field, Virginia, I asked Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn, who may well be our first astronaut into space, how he would feel if the Russians beat us into space. John, if 
the Russians get a man up before we do? How would you feel about that? Well, that's a good question because we've, we've been asked this many times. Uh, there's only one answer to that. It doesn't change our program one bit. This is uh, like saying that because Henry Ford started a new car first, uh, no one else should be in the automobile business today. The General Motors should have dropped out before they started. Well, this is ridiculous, of course, and it's probably a ridiculous example, but the fact that the Russians uh, happen to get a shot off or may not get a shot off be a little bit before we do doesn't alter the objectives of our program a bit. Our program is not set up just as a race to space. We're well aware of the international implications of this, but this doesn't alter the step-by-step -step progression that we want our program to go through to see that man safely starts space exploration. We have our goals. I guess they have theirs, and uh, the fact that they do or do not get a shot off ahead of us will not alter the objects of Project Mercury. We're not going to change our plan. No. Magazines, you've read it in the newspapers. In fact, perhaps you've even seen the owner's picture. Ralph Williams, the owner of Bayshore at Price of Plymouth, 345 El Camino Real in the city of San Bruno. You notice the big bald-headed son of a bitch? The man that came to San Francisco to offer them more for the dollar they spend. The man that came to San Francisco to rape each and every citizen in the whole San Francisco Bay Area. You don't believe it? Listen to me. I don't lie. Take a fucking car like this. A 1966 Ford, a Country Squire 9 Pastor station wagon. Don't worry about the equipment. Imagine all the fun you can have in the back. And while you're doing it, imagine all the money that that bald-headed prick Ralph Williams is going to be making on the car he's talk, trying to fuck you out of. Yes, the man that'll take every dime out of the San Francisco Bay Area and spend it on prostitutes, booze, and, of course, crap tables in the city of Las Vegas. I'm sure you've heard about it. So remember this. If you'd like to get fucked and hooked real hard before you buy a car, come down here. Let Ralph Williams do it. Why not? Why, why not somebody else? Remember our address is 345 El Camino Real in the city of San Bruno. But if you come from Marin County, East Bay Area, or San Jose, your money spends just as well as anybody else's. And when this bald-headed son of a bitch gets hold of you, you will spend money. Talking about payments, five years payments of $100 a month. You can't get even. So shop before you buy. Be sure. Chrysler Plymouth. <laughs> CBS Television presents a special report on Sputnik 1, the Soviet space satellite. Douglas Edwards reporting. Until two days ago, that sound had never been heard on this earth. Suddenly, it has become as much a part of 20th century life as the whir of your vacuum cleaner. It's a report from man's farthest frontier, the radio signal transmitted by the Soviet Sputnik, the first man-made satellite as it passed over New York earlier today. One of the places where the progress of the satellite is being watched most closely is the Hayden Planetarium in New York. CBS News correspondent Richard C. Hotelet reports from there now. Doug, we're in the great dome of the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and I have with me Dr. Kenneth Franklin, an astronomer on the planetarium staff. Dr. Franklin, can you tell us where the Sputnik is now and how it's moving? Right now it's north of Auckland, New Zealand, and moving southeast. It will be, in 10 minutes, about 1,500 miles north of Little America. And in about 24 minutes, it will be uh, over Santiago, Chile. And in about 50 minutes from now, it will be over Spain. Well, it looks as though it'll be missing the United States on this trip. That's quite correct, it will. But it does come over here periodically, doesn't it? It comes over here at least twice a day, and maybe more. Uh, getting back to this track, is it possible that it is transmitting a code not just a beep signal for uh, radio uh, uh, listening? Yes, it's quite possible that it's transmitting a code, uh, but we don't uh, realize what the code is, of course. The initial thrust to get it into the air comes from the lowest and biggest of the rockets in the tandem. When the American satellite is launched, the takeoff power will come from a rocket, like this one shown in a recent test. The powerful thrust of the arrow bee sends the whole assembly up through the dense stratosphere, a layer of heavy air, 50 miles thick, surrounding the Earth. The first rocket is then dropped, its fuel exhausted. A second rocket ignites and takes over. Altitude, 140 miles, satellite being stripped for action. It's that round ball in the nose. Altitude better than 250 miles, and the second rocket burns out. 
but its momentum carries the whole assembly forward. Second rocket spent, the third and last one takes over, the final thrust that carries the satellite into its chosen orbit. Then all the rocket power gone, but tremendous force has been built up, and the satellite is pushed off on its own at a speed of 18,000 miles an hour, a fixed course circling the Earth beyond the reach of the Earth's gravitational pull. Hundreds of miles in space, the satellite's instruments start collecting data, sending it back in the form of radio signals. A pilotless spaceship man's advance scout in outer space. <laughs> I usually take a size 36. We've heard in these reports from both at home and abroad this afternoon, the course of United States policies in the competition with Russia has been severely shaken. This is Douglas Edwards. Good evening.